All right, so last week uh, you heard something about the development of uh, notation for numbers and how that arose in the Babylonian society. And so today I'm going to speak to you about how this same society actually uh, appears to be some of the first uh, humans to have created a way to notate music. So here we have uh, something which appears to be either the first iPod or the first iPad. Um, there are good arguments for either one because it's clearly a tablet, um, a stone tablet, right? Not something you can swipe and, and swirl your finger across. Uh, but it's being used to store music. So is it really more of an iPod or an iPad? That's, you know, that's your decision. Uh, and this dates from approximately 1250 to 1200 uh, BC or BCE. Okay, so on this, um, on this slide, you'll be able, able to answer the first question. Uh, and this involves what is being uh, addressed on this tablet, okay? It, it's uh, a song that's written to be sung and to be uh, also played on a lyre, okay? Um, so these writings indicate that there are certain tunings for, for this lyre, or you could call it a harp, uh, very similar. Uh, it's a nine-string instrument, and it has seven different pitches that are played on it. Okay, the upper string and the lower string are octaves of each other, and, and that's thought to be uh, because the lowest strings have the least uh, volume when you pluck them. And so if you play a note and then you play another string that's an octave higher at the same time, uh, you get the illusion that the lower string is being sounded louder. Okay, for instance, if I play a little melody like that, but if it, you can hear it probably pretty well because this is an electric instrument, but if I play the octave higher at the same time, it seems louder to you, okay? And that's just a, a function of harmonics, which if there's time, we'll talk about a little bit uh, later on in this hour. So the strings were given individual names uh, by the, the Babylonians, and they had names for the relationships between the different strings. Uh, what they didn't seem to have is an abstract notion of, like, here's a distance between one pitch and another. It was, uh, they didn't use things like octaves or fourths or fifths the way we do today to say, okay, this is a, a fixed distance between two musical events. What they had were actually just, okay, this is what it sounds like when you pluck this string and this string at the same time. Okay, so uh, the next question, Carrie, question two can be answered here. Okay, so this is an example. It's a little, little out of focus, but if you squint, it's, it's okay. Uh, just to show you if you're not familiar with the idea of fourths and fifths in music, um, this first note, a C, is what we call in music a fourth away from the upper note. Sounds like, here comes the bride, okay? Uh, and then if we compare the distance between these two notes over on the right side, they are a fifth apart. So we have a fifth and we have a fourth. Okay, and as I said, uh, the Babylonians didn't they wouldn't have thought of that as a fifth and a fourth. They would have thought of that as the relationship between a particular string C and a particular string F. So there were certain ways that you could tune this lyre, okay, so that you could alter what was the highest note and what was the lowest note. And the way that they tuned these was in fourths and fifths, okay? So if you look at, uh, for instance, the Ishartum tuning here, the first one. First you would tune this, the second string to the pitch that we now call B, all right? Then you would go up a fourth to E. Then you would go down a fifth and tune string three to A. Then you would go up a fourth 
and tune the seventh string to D, and so on. And so that's how they, they had this kind of zigzag way of, uh, of tuning the strings to each other. Okay? And so with the, that first tuning, I would end up with a scale that goes C, B, A, G, F, E, D. Okay? It sounds very similar to our major scale. Um, but a word about the difference between how ancient people thought of scales, what they thought of uh, more as modes, and the way that we look at scales today. Okay? So the modern scale is a group of pitches that forms melodies, but this is very important. The melodies are guided by the underlying chord progressions that occur. Okay? Uh, a modern scale has what's called a tonic, and that's the most important note in the scale. It's the one that, that the ear wants to hear the music return to, is that tonic. And the reason for that is because of the harmony that underlies it. In music of you know, this era, and for many centuries to come, uh, before harmony was developed, it was only melody that was important. Okay? So, there was no underlying chord progression. It was only about the, the way that melodies were created. Now, um, I'm basing this information on an article by a scholar named M.L. West. And he makes a very good case in his article for the importance of the order of tuning the strings. Uh, but what it doesn't necessarily tell us is what was the most important note or notes in each of these strings. So when you form melodies, uh, certain patterns emerge that help to guide the way that you establish the importance of one pitch over another. Okay? And that's what we don't really know about these, these uh, modes, is like how, how are they used in the melody, necessarily. Although we have a clue from the tablet that I showed you in the first, um, in the first slide, the iPod or iPad. However, the different tunings, depending on how you tuned your lyre, okay, and the, it would create different sort of moods. Okay? In the same way that in the modern times, uh, if I play something that's in a major key uh, for my 10th grade class, then people feel at ease. And if I play something that's not in a major key, everybody says, oh, that feels so sad. Okay? It's just the, the way that uh, we've become conditioned to hear those harmonies. Well, to a much more subtle degree, each of these different ways of organizing the pitches had a different sort of um, mood reference for the ancient people. And so they would re result necessarily uh, in different texts to go with them. A love song, uh, for instance, would be more common in certain tunings of the lyre than in others. Okay, so in uh, certain ancient modes, the middle note tends to be the sort of center of gravity. Okay, uh, most likely, if you if you've got these nine notes that you're working with, uh, and you're going to sing a song probably the middle note is going to be where you're most comfortable, where your voice is most comfortable, and then you go lower and higher than that, and you'll tend to return to where that middle is. So it's thought that maybe in each of these tunings, somewhere around the middle might have been what we would call the final of the mode, or the, the most important pitch and the one that's going to end each melody that's written in that mode. Okay? But again, this is, this is kind of speculation. Uh, just like if I and don't imagine for a moment that I'm going to do this. But if I went and um, opened up your closet, I could see what clothes are in there, but I wouldn't know necessarily which ones are your favorite or how you would wear them together to form an outfit. It's the same thing here. We're, we're looking at groups of notes, but we don't necessarily know which ones were most important or how they were combined in a lot of cases. OK, so what exactly is on? this tablet? What's, what's the inf information that we're looking at? Well, it seems that when the tablets were complete, they generally bore uh, first a poetic text uh, that seemed to be a hymn, 
a hymn to the goddess written in the Hurrian language. Then there were some lines of musical notation, and then there was a, um, a little saying telling you, okay, this is a, a song to the gods, telling you what type of song it was, telling you how to tune your lyre so that you could perform this song properly, and then telling who wrote uh, the music and who was the scribe, okay? And, you know, we don't, we don't really use scribes that much anymore because anybody can just pick up their laptop and, or their iPad and type. But you can see when you're carving stuff into rocks, a scribe is a pretty important person, right? You've got to have the skill of like making letters in something hard. OK, so the next question can be answered from this slide. Uh, so what would you expect music notation to be telling you? Okay. First of all, you would want what's on the tablet to convey its information as directly as possible. That's what you would expect, right? It shouldn't be something that's like completely bizarre and hard to understand. And what information would you be looking for? Well, you would want to know when the pitch goes up, when the pitch goes down, and when the pitch stays the same, right? The, the contour of the pitch. Uh, you would want to know if there are any repeated notes. And based on uh, everything else that's known about music from ancient times, you would be looking for heterophonic music. Okay? Heterophony is what occurs when somebody has a birthday in the cafe and start, a group of their friends start to sing happy birthday to them. All right. So you've got a group of people who are all trying to sing the same melody. And it's kind of almost like they are, right? But not quite. Like you have that person that doesn't quite hit the, the top note. Happy birthday, right? So there's these slight variations. Or maybe you have some hot shot who just kind of is like, happy birthday, right? So, so a group of people are singing almost the same thing, right? It's not exactly the same. They're not like robots programmed to do the same exact notes. But it's pretty close, all right? So in heterophonic music, you could have a group of people or a person who is singing and accompanying himself playing the same melody, all right? But maybe he's singing the melody in a more straightforward way, and on the, on the lyre, he's adding a few little ornaments or something like that, all right? That's heterophonic singing, all right, which is different than singing over harmony. All right, so heterophony, think of that, again, as, as happy birthday, people singing the same thing, but not exactly the same thing, all right? There's little slight variations, OK? That's as opposed to harmony. Again, if you're singing a melody that is accompanied by harmony, the direction of the chord progression helps to guide the way that you understand the melody itself, OK? When the melody occurs with a chord progression beneath it, the direction of the, the chords, the way that the chords progress from dissonant to consonant, guides the way that the melody occurs, OK? OK, so here's what the information that we find on the tablet. And it then comes down to how it is interpreted. OK, it appears that we have interval signs. OK, and again, it wouldn't be like play a fourth here. It would be like play the interval that means this string and this string specifically on the lyre. And then there was a number after it. OK, so scholars are trying to figure out what do these symbols convey. Do they convey harmonic intervals and telling you how many times to do them? Okay? Harmonic intervals are intervals where both notes sound at the same time. Okay? So if I have a symbol for this interval and then a number five after it, does it mean that I'm supposed to go? Okay, one possibility. Do these uh, interval signs represent certain formulas, uh, melodic formulas, okay, things that 
like a shorthand for saying, okay, if I, if I put this symbol, that means play this figure, okay? And if it has that symbol and then a, a three after it, then I go, okay? So another possibility. Turns out these are ones that, um, so there was a musicologist named Anne Draftcorn Kilmer who put out her particular um, interpretation of this. And this is in question six, Carrie. Um, this is a very widely known interpretation of this particular ancient hymn, okay? And the reason for that is that she wrote it out in modern notation, her interpretation. She created a recording of it and these materials got picked up by some very widely used music history texts, okay? So if you went to college <clears throat> as a music major uh, and you had your music history class, which is of course uh, part of the core curriculum for any music major, uh, you would come across this interpretation, this recording, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and so that became a very well-known version of it. <clears throat> Uh, M.L. West has some problems with this interpretation, though. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the issues, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little uh, froggy today. Um, one of the issues is that if you interpret the notation this way, the vocal melody can't be wider than a five-note range. <clears throat> and this seems a little strange because the range that's capable of being played by the lyre with its nine strings is wider than that, okay? So why would your musical notation not take advantage of the full range of the instrument, okay? So that, that's one of the things that, that told M.L. West, I don't really agree with, uh, with what Kilmer said. The other thing is it calls for harmony throughout. Okay, it calls for, the, for two notes to be sounded at the same time throughout the entire uh, piece. And that seems very out of character with what you would expect uh, based on music of ancient Egypt, Greece, all these civilizations that, that followed the Babylonians. Okay? So let's listen to a little bit of this very popular recording. Not popular, but widely known. So um, M.L. West had a different approach to interpreting the information from the tablet, okay? Um, he thought that it seemed more likely that where the numbers appeared, they were telling you which string to play and which hand to play it with, okay? Which would then allow the melody to pass from one hand to the other at times, and it would be more um, consistent with the, the shape of a melody that you would expect just based on other ancient civilizations, okay? And in this case, you can see how some of the notes are doubled, they're in octaves, and that would mean that one of the notes is played on the lowest string and the other one is on the highest string, and that would, again, boost the volume of that lowest note. So we would consider the lowest note to be the actual melody note and then the upper note to be a, a little boost of that. Okay, so it come out uh, sounding something like this.
Now, maybe you don't see what the big deal is here, but uh, the, the fact that there's no harmony included seems a little bit more logical with this time, uh, this, this time period. Also, the relationship between the notes is much clearer in this version. Okay? You have uh, the note D that starts and ends the piece, so it seems to give prominence to that particular note. At the end of the first line, it ends on a note that is a fifth away from D, it ends on A. So if we assume that this is our final for the mode, then this note is probably the next string over on the lyre, okay? And because it's, it's tuned a fifth away. And in modern music, that corresponds to, um, if this is the tonic of a, of a um, say, a minor scale, then this note would be the dominant, OK? So as a, a precursor to this cadence, we have, all right? And then the other note that seems to be repeated a lot is this G, which is a fourth away. So again, we're we're dealing with these tunings of fourths and fifths on the lyre, and it, it, it seems to correspond a little bit better. All right, so why do we care about this? Well, the Babylonians created these different lyre tunings, which generated these different musical modes, these collections of, of diatonic pitches. And they're very similar to what we find in the ancient Greeks, but they predate them by about 1,000 years. Okay, so it seems that the Babylonians were about a, at least a thousand years ahead of what the Greeks would eventually discover or maybe learn from uh, the Babylonians. So it appears that the, the civilization that first recorded numbers and figured out a way to do that seems to be also the civilization that brought us the first musical score. So Ms. D'Agostino set this up for us very nicely by showing us uh, Donald Duck playing with uh, the different lengths of a string and getting different pitches, okay? And that forms the basis of what we're going to talk about with Pythagoras here. All right, so what you see at the top of this slide is a monochord, all right? It's a single chord stretched across a, a particular distance and in the middle there, you can see a bridge, all right? And the, where the position of the bridge is allows you to change what portion of the string is being plucked, all right? Just like any, anybody here play guitar? OK, good. I should have had you guys bring your guitars. That would have been kind of cool. Uh, but right, when you press your finger against a certain part of the string and then pluck it with your finger or with your pick or whatever, uh, it changes the pitch of the string, right? Okay. When you pluck a string, sound it begins a vibration, right? It starts the, the, the string vibrating, okay? And it vibrates a certain number of times per second, okay? We call that the frequency of the vi vibration. And human beings perceive the frequency of a musical sound as pitch, okay? The more times per second that the sound wave travels along the length of a particular string, the more times per second makes it a higher pitch, okay? If it's fewer times per second, then it's a lower pitch, okay? So frequency literally means how frequently does the wave travel back and forth across the distance of the string. So the myth of Pythagoras has him doing experiments with the monochord, all right? Seeing what happens when you change the length of the string being plucked, okay? So the shorter of the string length, the more times a wave can travel across it in a second, all right? It makes sense, doesn't it? If you're, let's say your, uh, your boarding house is 20 minutes from here, and another boarding house is 10 minutes away. If you were to send a van going back and forth between the two boarding houses, you could go 
10 minutes away twice as often as you could go 20 minutes away. OK, so as, uh, as Donald discovered in that brief video that we watched, uh, having the string length gives you a pitch an octave higher. Okay? In other words, if your string is of such a length that plucking it gives you this note, then if you were to stop the string halfway so that you're only plucking half of it, then you would get this note, an octave higher. Okay? And again, you can make it half again as long and get another octave higher. Okay? So they discovered that the ratio of the frequency of the upper pitch to the lower pitch in an octave was two to one. Okay? The Greek word for ratio was logos. And that's kind of interesting because it also means word, thought, and reason. So the discovery of relationships between the abstract worlds of math and music was the beginning of scientific exploration. And this was a way that the Pythagoreans tried to understand everything around them, that there was an order to everything that just had to be found, that you could find these relationships. OK, now, what happens when you pluck a string is that it generates not only one pitch, but actually a whole series of pitches. So when I pluck the string, it vibrates back and forth across its length, OK? And that creates what we hear as the fundamental frequency, OK? In other words, if I pluck the C string of a cello, then I hear a C, OK? Because it's tuned to that frequency. It's tuned to allow the wave to travel the right amount of times per second for me to hear a C. But I'm also, at the same time, going to hear some other things happening. Because while it vibrates along its whole length, it's also vibrating along half of its length. And it's vibrating twice as many times. Okay, So the, vib uh, the string vibrates as a whole, but also in halves. It also vibrates in thirds. It also vibrates in fourths. It also vibrates in fifths, and so on. And so this is uh, an infinite series of what we call harmonics that are being generated. So what seems like a very simple thing is actually pretty complex once you combine the motion of all these different waves together. It becomes not just a simple up and down sort of sine wave, but something that's, that's much more complex and generating more sounds than that. Because you have all these different waves occurring together. OK, so this is not quite as cool to look at, but another demonstration of the vibrations that are happening in halves, in thirds, and in quarters along the strings. All right, so this generates what we call a harmonic series. So to give you an example of one of those, um, if I play this note, say on, well, any instrument really, or sing this note, C, all right, it generates a series of notes above it. We hear this one as a pitch. We hear that we determine its frequency with our ear, and, and we measure that as a certain pitch. But it also generates its octave, and then the fifth above it, and the fourth above it, and the third above that, and the third above that, and the third above that. And then it starts to get into smaller and smaller distances. OK, we call that the harmonic series. But we don't hear all of these as pitches. We don't hear like this great chord whenever we play any note. Right? Unless we've accidentally left on the auto accompany feature on our electric keyboard or something like that. Okay? We hear these other notes that are generated in the harmonic series as timbre, as the color of the sound. Okay? It's part of the reason why if, say, a violin and a flute each play the same pitch, 
you can still tell them apart as different instruments. Because when you play a violin string, certain ones of these harmonics are reinforced by the shape of the violin's resonator, Mr. Shade. The, um, the pitches that are reinforced by the way that the instrument's shape causes them to resonate helps to contribute to you listening to it and say, oh, that's obviously a violin being played. Okay? Whereas the different shape of the resonator of a flute reinforces different ones of these harmonics. And to our ear, it gives it a different color. The same thing happens in your own body when you speak or sing. Your vocal cords actually just kind of produce a sort of buzzing noise. And it's the way that the resonator above that is shaped that determines how people hear your pitch or your words, and especially your vowel sounds. All right, so just very quickly, um, to show you what Pythagoras discovered, very simple ratios between these different intervals, very common intervals, all right? We have the two to one ratio that you can see here between the upper note and the lower note of the octave. They have a frequency of two to one. Now if you look at the next couple of places in the harmonic series, you can see that the ratio of the upper note to a lower note in a fifth from G to C is three to two, and the fourth is four to three, all right? So the, there are very, these very simple concrete um, ratios that are easy to understand. They're, they're very simple numbers, and they uh, illustrate these intervals a relationship between them. And these are the intervals that, to people of ancient Greece, sounded good. They liked to hear octaves. They liked to hear fifths. They liked to hear fourths, okay? They didn't like to hear thirds so much. We love those today. But they consider those to be dissonant, all right? And that's not surprising because um, the ratio for a major third, for instance, is 81 to 64. And that's, uh, that's not quite as nice as 4 to 3 or something simple like that. All right. So there's a very cool proportion that you can see on here, and I wish I had more time to explain it, but we're, we'll, continue. Um, we'll continue another day. Yeah. Okay.